Framing Bodies is an exhibition with works by 15 artists from the Hasselblad Foundation's collection. They all illustrate photography's ability to frame, define and control, as well as to acknowledge and support rarely seen environments and people. We have divided the works into four different themes, surveillance and discipline, non-normative lifestyles and non-conforming genders, depictions of labor and economy, and finally, exposures of racism and colonial oppression. Surveillance is obviously a very current and much discussed topic. Both lens-based surveillance and data registration and biometrics have a direct link to the history of photography as identification. For instance, in scientific registration, bureaucratic organization, police archives, and so on. In the series Istanbul Double Frequency, Santiago Mostin assumed the role of a tourist taking photographs while visiting Istanbul's sites. He quickly noticed the constant presence of surveillance cameras and he began gathering material from the cameras that have filmed him on his walk. And you can often see the flash of his camera in the footage. In his diptychs, he places two perspectives next to each other, the surveillance imagery and his own personal portraits of the people in the city. The genre of street photography has an element of that voyeurism and involuntary registration, which we also associate with the surveillance gaze. One example of this is Bruce Gilden's portraits from the streets of New York in the 80s and 90s. Gilden moves discreetly among people and never asks permission before snapping a picture of someone's face. He just fires the flash and quickly moves on. Ulf Lundin is also investigating the limits of voyeurism, strategies of spying and the aesthetics of surveillance. He made an agreement with a childhood friend who allowed Lundin to photograph him and his family without them knowing when. The results look a bit like detective photographs and we can also think of them as evidences of normativity of nuclear family life in a Swedish residential suburb. The prison, where surveillance is a decisive and explicit part of the institution, is a place that interests the Argentinian photographer Adriana Lestido. In the early 90s, she visited a women's prison in Argentina each week for a year. She photographed the women's fateful arrivals to this facility, their daily life in the crowded cells, and their social interaction with each other, but also the dramatic separations from the children when they were too old to remain. Photography is also used as a means of creating identity and recognition of people different from the norm. The following works illustrate the lives of often marginalized LGBTQ people and the examples we bring forth span from the late 19th century until today. Norwegian photographers Marie Hø and Bolette Bell ran a studio together in the late 1890s. Among the many conventional portraits the couple took of the bourgeois customers were later discovered some private photographs of Marie and Bolette dressing up and performing for the camera, often in drag. It is Marie Hoy we see in most of them. She was also passionately involved in the contemporary campaign for women's right to vote. In 1983, Christa Stromholm released a book of what would become one of his most famous series called Les Amis de Place Blanche. The photographs were taken between the late 50s and 60s when Stromholm lived in Paris and photographed a group of transsexual women working as sex workers in the area of Place Blanche and Pigalle. Strömholm became friends with them and was allowed into their daily lives for many years. The photographs became his homage to these marginalized women. American artist Nan Golden can be seen in the same photographic tradition as Christa Strömholm, with very personal documentations of the people closest to her, and they can all be said to live outside of society's norms. Her intimate pictures from the 1980s and 90s of queer friends living with HIV and AIDS have been groundbreaking, and so has her book, The Ballad of Sexual Dependency. Annika Carlsson Rikson has also worked consistently with issues of queer life and activism. The series, called At the Time of the Third Reading, shows a lesbian camp on an island in Russia, where the community is safe from harassment. The pictures are taken at the same time as a law passed prohibiting the distribution of information about so-called non-traditional sexual relations in Russia. 
And with her camera, Carlson Rixon mimics the authority's scrutiny of non-conforming people, but at the same time she respectfully refrains from exposing their faces, which could lead to persecution. Our access to public space can be regulated by law, which can be witnessed in Russia, but it can also be regulated by strongly rooted norms. Anne Sophie Sidian's work, Untitled Studies Sketches for Fide Commissum, shows a woman squatting and peeing. And this simple and humorous act makes visible a convention usually reserved for men, so the sculpture becomes a clear feminist marking of territory. The photographs were taken as studies for public park sculpture that is now installed at Vanos Sculpture Park. The history of photography is rich with examples of framings of the working body. Our third perspective concerns socio-economic structures and the use of photographs to visualize otherwise hidden fates. Photographs have been important documentary tools, not least in political and social reform. A classical example of this are the pictures made for the Farm Security Administration during the American Depression in the 1930s and the FSA aimed to document poverty in rural areas. Particularly, Walker Evans' photographs have become iconic. However, these pictures were taken on a leave from FSA in the summer of 1936 during a visit to Hale County, Alabama. Evans became acquainted with three tenant farmer families whom he spent two months with. The pictures later appeared in the book Let Us Now Praise Famous Men. Around 30 years later, Swedish photographer anne Kristin Ek co-published the book Working, Not Slaving to Death. It was about working mothers, and it argued for six-hour working days. Ek's photographs are an example of how social-political photographs in the 70s were often presented in books along with factual texts, reports, and interviews. The aim was to depict the circumstances of people who otherwise would not be heard and to contribute to the political debate on inequality between men and women. The images in Annika von Haushof's series, An Oral Story of Economic Structure, are still lifes with gold teeth. The artist purchased the teeth online, which creates a disturbing allusion to the human body as a commodity and financial desperation. The series examines capital flows and economic conditions on a personal level as well as globally. Teeth that were once in someone's mouth and are filling one of our most basic needs are now sold on the Internet's global markets where gold has an eternal value. The fourth theme in Framing Bodies covers works where photography has been used to expose racial discrimination and illuminate histories of colonial oppression. Ernest Cole was one of the first photographers to document the apartheid system in South Africa in the 60s, and some of his most famous pictures show the exploitation of black workers in the country's gold mines. We see how registering for work involved medical examinations, and how fingerprints were taken to permit the workers to enter white areas. Cole's aim was to spread information to the outside world about the structural racism in South Africa. And this was, of course, a dangerous endeavor, and he emigrated to the U.S., where his pictures were finally published in the now legendary book House of Bondage. Ken Klich has worked in areas of conflict for many years, particularly in the Gaza Strip. The pictures included in this exhibition show ruins and funerals, reflecting some of the common sights for the people of Gaza who are experiencing violence, death and sorrow on a daily basis. In some of the images, we catch a glimpse of the wall between Israel and Gaza in the background. Photography as a tool for classifying people for racial biological purposes is a theme in Jorma Puranen's series Imaginary Homecoming. He has used ethnological portrait studies of the Sami people taken in 1884. He re-photographed the portraits and placed them in the landscapes where they had originally been taken, and in this way he made a symbolic reunion between the people and the landscape and reclaimed Sami identity. Photography has always constructed and rendered subjects and realities visible. The works in framing bodies shed light on lives that otherwise would never have been told, and they offer new realizations and alternative perspectives on established notions about the world. But they also remind us of the normative and controlling power of the medium, which is still exercised today. <laughs>